We are doing a new series, and we're calling it Shaped, Shaped by God. Now, I must admit there is, is a, 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 an interest that I have in this because God is the creator, and I can just see him at work, either in a painting mode or in a sculpting mode or something where he is shaping us into what he wants us to be. And so each week in the next uh, four or five weeks, we're going to be looking at what tools God uses to shape us with. Now, uh, many have, have called uh, this idea discipline. And I want you to know that in that word, there is the word disciple. And so you'll hear that word as we move along through these weeks. But understand that I am wanting this focus in the next few weeks to not so much be about us. We talk a lot about ourselves. I'm hoping, though, that we can spend some time talking about God, talking about what he has intended by how he wants to shape us. And so today we want to talk about divine guidance. This is one tool that God uses to shape us into what he wants us to be. He, he guides us and therefore what, what happens when we listen is a transformation from what we would have been if we had not listened. Because as I said to a number of kids this week, um, we always have choice. That is, I believe, something that God has instilled in us. We have choice, we have the ability to say yes or no, and in fact, we know that we are here today in this situation in the valley of the shadow of death because Adam and Eve said no. So I want you to know that God allows you to say no. He gives you choice. I actually believe that even when we reach the other side of life in the eternal sense and we are living in the presence of God, he is not going to take away our power of choice. So as we talk about these things, as we, as we maybe experience some of these things, we are going to, to really need to understand that you don't have to do what God says. But as I said to the kids this week, there'll be consequences. Good or bad, if you listen to God, there'll be consequences. And if you don't listen to God, there'll be consequences. Okay? He's trying to shape us into being uh, ready for translation. Let's just put it that way. There's a transformation process that must take place so that we will be in the kind of shape that, that, that will be acceptable, if you like, in heaven. And that simply can be put into physical terms, if you like. Uh, remember the story of Moses. Moses wants to see God. God says, you cannot see me i.e. in your current state, with your current body, if you see me, you will die. So that is why he has to give us new bodies. He has to give us the ability to exist in his presence. We understand this from watching too many science fiction movies, don't we? I, I hope you do, because that's how I'm understanding it. Is in my present state of being, I cannot see God. But I want to see God, just like Moses did. He is saying, look, uh, stick with me. Uh, we're going to work this out. And then there's going to be a big change. And that big change is going to also include a new body. Amen. All of those of you who had to take uh, pain pills this week. Amen. There's going to be a new body. I didn't hear any amens. Amen. All right. All right. So we, we know we're getting older. We know where those creaks and groans are in our body. And sometimes we, you know, try to keep those pains at bay. There's going to be a new body. We are going to be shaped by God. But this is also about our mentality. It's also about our relationship with him in the here and now. So. I'm going to be upfront with you in a kind of a teaching sense today uh, and, and every week for this uh, time together. And here is your assignment. You thought, oh my goodness, I thought we weren't in school. Nope. We'd like this series to be more of a, uh, of a synagogue type experience where we come and talk about these things, come together and reason with God about these things. So this week, your assignment is to read 1 Samuel. All right? We'll talk about it next week, but 
uh, I'd like you to read 1 Samuel. Spend some time in the Word. Look at the way that God guides his people. So come next week and uh, we'll hear a little bit more about people's uh, findings from reading 1 Samuel. But today, we're reaching into the Word to see what divine guidance looks like. It's a primary method. That's what I'm going to say first. It's a primary method by which God chooses to guide us today. Because of the fact that we are a literate society, and even when, uh, even if we go back into uh, Bible times, Old Testament and New Testament, we find that this is how God guided his people. Not only were things spoken, but they were also then written down. And then read again. Uh, I remember the story as a child reading about little good, good King Joash. Do you remember that story? He was the one who found the scroll of Isaiah and said, hey, bring it out, let's read it again. So in some respects, that's what we're doing with this series, is we're saying, let's bring out the scrolls again, let's read them again. There are stories in the Old Testament, stories in the New Testament, and so we're going to start with the Old Testament. One of my favorites is found in Judges chapter 6. So if you want to turn in your Bibles or your phones, I don't know what you choose, doesn't matter to me, but Judges chapter 6 verse 1 says again. Don't you hate it when it's again? <laughs> but you're going to find this when you read 1 Samuel. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he, the Lord, gave them into the hands of the Midianites. <laughs> Here's a, a, a favorite story in which you find that the Israelites are now needing to be saved again. We think of ourselves as needing salvation. We think of ourselves in our own situation. But could it be that some of the situation in which we find ourselves is because we have not been following? And therefore, God has said, okay, if that's the direction you want to go, fine. But there are going to be consequences. I said this to a small a group of small kids and you could see their eyes like, oh no, not consequences. Because like, like all consequences are bad? What about these consequences? If you do your homework tonight, we'll go out for ice cream. You can even tell by the tone of my voice. These consequences are not bad. These are good consequences. In other words, we would not even call them consequences. We would call them rewards. But are not rewards also consequences? So please don't, please don't put everything that God does into this, this bad category. Oh, the Israelites were bad again. And so what happened was God allows the Midianites to come in and to take over. And what they would do, just to give you an idea, is they would come in at the time of harvest and they would take all of the grain that had just been harvested, leaving the Israelites with nothing to eat, and then leave. So it wasn't as if they were trying to kill the Israelites with the sword, although I think they were doing that too, but they were taking away the food that they had produced. And so the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in the mountain clefts, the caves, and the strongholds. And verse 3, whenever the Israelites planted their food, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. So their, their animals were pillaged as well. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. Let us never forget that God made a promise to Abraham, which was then given to Jake, uh, Isaac, and then was given to Jacob, and then was given to his people. This is an everlasting promise, and so even when there is trouble in the land, even when there is difficulty in 
what they are doing. He has not gone away. He has not left them. It is just that he cannot continue to bless them because they are not interested in having, them, having him be part of their lives. So think of it in this way. Uh, God would love to bless you, but could it be that you are not interested in his blessings? That might be something that we could take from this very situation because we find a man named Gideon who is, using, is, is a very, very smart guy and he is threshing his grain in a wine press. Like, no, these dumb Midianites are not going to look for my grain in a wine press. So that's going to keep me in grain this, this winter. So he, he is thinking that he is smart, but he gets a visit. He gets a visit. Now we're looking at divine guidance today. He gets a visit from an angel. Now we think, wow, that hasn't happened in a long time. Uh, no, I don't know of it happening in my time that you know, somebody could say that an angel visited me, sat on a rock over there, and waited while I prepared a three-course meal for him. Because look, look what it says. But sir, Gideon says, uh, please wait here. Please wait here, and I will go and prepare a meal for you. What does he prepare? He prepares lamb. He prepares bread. You know how long this takes? I don't think he had a fridge. So this takes a while, and the angel sits there patiently. He sits there patiently and uh, waits. He says to Gideon, take the meat and the unleavened bread and place them, this is verse 20, place them on the rock and pour out the broth. There was gravy too. Sorry if I'm making you hungry. <laughs> With the tip of his staff, he touched the meat and the unleavened bread. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When we think about how God shapes us, he often uses direct communications. This kind of situation, like I said, I have never heard of somebody entertaining an angel that burnt up the dinner that they prepared for them. This is, this is truly kind of an Old Testament biblical situation, but we can, we can be sure that this is God trying to get a hold of Gideon's attention and he's doing it through personal, personal intervention. He's given a job to do at this point by the angel and he is told that he is to knock down the altars to Baal and to cut down the pole that was significant of the Asherah cult. You see, the Israelites, in their relationship with God, had basically decided not to serve God, and they had gone about joining with the people of their area in worshiping the sun god and the moon goddess, Baal and Ashtoreth. If you think those religions are dead, just uh, check them out in your local mall where there are rock shops and other Places. Have you seen that sticker on the back of people's car sometime that says, love your mother, and there's a picture of the world. And you're thinking, what, Mother Earth? Yeah, yeah, Mother Earth. The vestiges of this religion are still to be had today, if you look for them. And there are people who are very much involved with the worship of the created instead of the worshiping of the Creator. To me, that is the distinction between true, true Christianity or true worship of the true God and worship of the false. If you're worshiping something that is created, you are worshiping something that has been worshiped by uh, people who did not want to worship God for ages and ages. It just comes in different forms. God visits Gideon 
through an angel visit, and that is one of the ways in which he gets into Gideon's life and begins to shape him. His first job is to knock down these altars and these pillars, and he's scared. Now, I think I would be too, because these belong to the community. He is literally going to deface community property. And not only that, he is going to deface a holy site in the community. Now, we know what happens when these things happen in our community, where one group defaces uh, the holy site of another group. It's a hate crime. He is asked by God to go and do this as a sign of commitment to the mission. He decides to do it at night. It's a little easier to get away with, right? If you're going to do the graffiti, do it at night. If you're going to deface something, do it at night. You won't get seen. Maybe the cameras won't see you, right? And in its place, as part of the mission, you are to cut the Asherah pole up for firewood. You are then to take bullock number two, the prize bulls that your dad owns that are basically like his tractor for his garden. You're to take bullock number two and sacrifice it on top of an altar that has been specifically put together to honor God. There were altars that were known for honoring God. This is what he is to do first. Gideon accepts the mission. He does what God asks. Then God says, now I want you to call all the men together because we are going to uh, take on the Midianites. Now Gideon is saying, now we're talking. He calls, he calls all the army together. But Gideon still wants confirmation. And this is the, this is the picture uh, that is on the front of your bulletin today. Thank you, Amy. Uh, she always chooses such interesting pictures. He is ready, he's doing, but he just wants to know that God is happy with what he's doing. You ever felt like that? I know I have. And so he asks God to make a fleece wet in the morning with dew. Have you ever, you ever tested God? You've ever Ask God, God, is this really you that's talking to me? Is this really you that's, that's telling me to go and do this? I need to know. And then you ask him to do something, and then, uh, like Gideon, you realize, oh, that's, that's, that's what would normally happen. It's not a miracle that the fleece was wet in the morning, because of course it's going to have dew on it. That's when the dew falls, and the fleece is... God, do you mind? Uh, could we do the experiment again? Have you ever thought maybe God might be just a little irritated? No, he's not. He's not irritated with us when we ask for confirmation that what he wants us to do is this thing and we would just like to know for sure. I think he's that kind of God. I think he is, he is going to be okay with us asking for confirmation of his guidance. Next morning... The fleece is dry and the ground is wet. Yes, Gideon, this is what I want you to do and this is how I want you to do it. Army is together. The next piece is God comes to him and says, there's too many. Now I want you to know <laughs> that when you look at the numbers in this story, there was way fewer, when they were at their maximum, there was way fewer of the Israelites than all of the Midianites. And God says there's too many Israelites. Are you kidding, God? Again, uh, God is trying to shape Gideon into uh, somebody who knows him and understands him and is ready to work with him. Ever felt like that? Felt like God is trying to work with you, trying to shape you, and you have certain ideas about how things should go, and God says, no. That's not how we're going to do it, because you see, if you do it that way, and this is what the Bible says, if you do it that way, the Israelites will think that they won the battle themselves. Now, I'm sorry to tell you, 
Now this is where we always get tangled up. We even get blamed as a denomination. Oh, you're those people who are such legalists. Have you ever thought that being a legalist might backfire on you? That if you claim to be that which saves yourself, that when you mess up, oh, it's so bad because that thing that you thought you were so good at, you're not good at, and therefore you're not saved. At least I feel, I'll tell you this, I am so thankful for the grace of God. Amen? I'm thankful that it's his job, not mine, to judge. He's very straight about that, Jesus is. He says, judge not. And why is this, folks? Why is this that he goes this direction? I'll tell you right now. It's because it is for his glory and not ours. Yes. We are working on being part of his family. We attempt this every week. We try to cooperate with him as much as possible. And as I prayed this morning, all of us know that there were times this week when we did not cooperate with God. And so when we don't cooperate with him, he also gets the black eye. You thought about that? So I'm really glad that I do not have to claim to be saving myself. God says there are too many in this army because if they win, they're going to think they did it themselves. And this is not going to be that kind of win. It's going to be a win that is very obviously engineered by the Lord of hosts. You need to remember that, that as God shapes us, he's wanting us to realize who we are and who he is and not get the two confused because that's the invitation of the devil is it not oh you don't have to listen to God you can be your own God you can do whatever you want it's very enticing Eve said yes and then Adam said yes and if you are honest with yourself every last one of us has said yes I like that idea. I'm going to do my own thing. And I'm going to get credit for it. This thing about giving God credit, giving God praise, giving God honor. Ooh, uh, ooh it's, it's hard. It's hard to, let, let, let's just say, it might not even be American. Up by your own bootstraps, I did it. I made this millions and, and look at me. Ever, ever, ever run into somebody who said, no, I didn't make these millions. God gave them to me to manage. How many stories have you heard like that recently? Not any. It's just not in our way of thinking because we want to do it for us and we want the glory. God says to Gideon, there are too many soldiers. Tell all those who are even just a little wee bit afraid to go home. And Gideon, he just about freaks at this moment because most of the army goes home. He says, we're going to win them again. We're going we're gonna to test them again, send them down to the river, and those who just walk through and pick up and put in their mouths, take those guys. But those that kneel down and, and, and really get into the drinking at the edge of the water, tell them to go home. What? Are you? Yes, this is what. He does what God wants him to do, and he has ended up, he ends up with 300 there were thousands that showed up and he winnows them down. God winnows them down to 300. Not because the other guys who went home were bad. I really don't believe that. Yeah, maybe they were afraid. But I believe that God wanted to use 300 people who knew that they were going into battle and that the, the win was going to be God's because there was no other way that it was going to happen. 
friend of mine said several years ago, we should be living where if God doesn't show up, we are going to fall flat on our faces. And we say, oh yeah, ah, that's right. Can any of you maybe stand up right now and say, I'd like to give a testimony of how that feels and that I didn't really like it. I thought we were going to die because you were at the end of your resources. There was no further creative idea about how to solve your problem. And that was when you knew that the only way that you were going to get out of the situation was by the grace of God. I think if you've lived more than 25 years in your life, you might be able to tell a story about that. Maybe you could tell a story if you've lived 12 years of your life. You've come to the end of your resources and God says, it's not going to be for your glory, it's going to be for mine. This, this type of communication with Gideon helps him to understand the kind of God that he's dealing with and who he is serving. God is so kind. He sends Gideon down to the camp. Remember this part of the story? He sends him down to the camp and he, he listens in on a conversation about a dream that God has already given. This is before Gideon listens to the recitation. He has already given the previous night a dream to one of the Midianite soldiers who then tells his buddy in the tent about this, this barley loaf. This giant barley loaf that rolls down through the camp and just mushes all the Midianites. And this is, I mean, the CGI on this would be crazy. <laughs> Big, huge bread loaf. Boom, 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 boom. He didn't know what was, the dream was about. The Midianite didn't know. His, his, his tent mate thought that he was crazy and having weird dreams and probably asked him what he ate that night. But Gideon knows that this is the word of the Lord. He knows that barley is the, the, the grain of redemption. So it wasn't, it wasn't just wheat, it was barley. Barley meant that God was going to save and that he was going to utterly save goes back and he now knows that even though God has winnowed his, his group down to 300 that he is going to perform a complete routing, a complete defeat. So Gideon uh, is helped by the symbol that God uses of the barley loaf. I, I don't know about you but I, I think that the Bible shows us several symbols that communicate to us and help us in the shaping that God wants to do with us. Um, if I had been with the Israelites and the Egyptians had been chasing me and I had watched the pillar of cloud, remember it was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, did you know that God was into air conditioning? I mean, think about it. Cloud lowers the temperature. Fire raises the temperature. We're talking about the desert where there's a temperature swing of possibly 60 to 80 degrees. Day, night. God provides air conditioning for his people. And it's also a protection because it moves from the front of the group to the rear of the group where the Egyptians are coming and it causes their side to be night and it causes the Israelite side to be day so that they can cross the Red Sea. Symbols. God uses them in teaching us about himself so that he can work with us. He can shape us, transform us. End of the story. It's, um, it, it, it's bloody. And it has nothing to do with the 300. Because they are not even armed with swords. Pitchers covering torches with trumpets. What? What kind of military outfit is this? These are the 300 that the Lord sends down three different places into this valley and the Midianites and the Amalekites and the Eastern peoples who are like locusts in the land start killing 
each other. The bread roll just rolls down through the valley. And a great victory is won. And Gideon gets made the judge of Israel. Read the rest of the story tonight because it will tell you that it didn't always go so well for Gideon. You think, oh, he lived happily ever after. Read the story and you'll find that there's a, there, it is of great interest that things did not go as well. I wanted also to give you a quick New Testament example of how the community reacted when God, through Jesus, heals a blind man, blind from birth. The story is very simple. Jesus sees this guy, his disciples ask him, did this man sin or did his parents sin that he was born blind? I don't know about you, but I'm glad that we live in an era of grace. I am certainly hoping that none of us would ask the same question of someone today. I hope that we don't say in our hearts, well, this happened to this person be, you know, because they are a sinner. And that God is punishing this poor child or this parent with, with, with the fact that they would have a child that was born blind. I am glad that, to say that, that because we understand that, the, that, that God is trying to shape us and work with us as he does every day, he, he is not doing it to hurt us. He is not doing it to make us mad with him. But he is doing it to help us understand him better. Jesus does this, this miracle. I, I love this story because he takes spit. It's, it's very personal. I mean, uh, we, we think of uh, Mary, you know, with Jesus meek and mild like this. But, you know, did you know that Jesus could hock a loogie like the rest of us? <laughs> That's what he does. He spits. He spits on the ground in the dust and he mixes it with his finger. This is the finger of God. This is the spit of God in human form. And he takes this mud that he has made with the spit and he plasters it on the eye sockets of this guy who has never seen anything in his life. It's very, very kinesthetic. Very touch-oriented. This is God in touch with humanity. He sends him to a particular fountain, a particular pool to wash. It's the pool of Siloam. And, and, and the commentator, the Bible writer says, which means sent. So my friends today, if you, if you don't feel like you have a very clear picture of God, ask him to put his fingers on your eyes. Ask him to, to put, him, put his fingers on your eyes and then send you to the pool of Siloam. So that then with this renewed vision or maybe a new completely new perspective, you can see the world the way that God wants you to see the world. Because that's what happens. He, he, he comes away after having washed the mud. He opens his eyes and instead of seeing nothing, he now sees everything. It is, it, it, it's, it's, it's fantastic. It's amazing. What is even more amazing, but is so hurting to me as a church person, as a believer, is the way in which the church people respond. 
God, even Jesus says that this is going to happen so that God can be glorified. He exists. He's grown up blind so that he can do this thing at this moment. Have you ever thought that your life might have existed so that you could do one thing? That you came because God fit you into the puzzle of the whole plan of, of, of humanity because you were to do one thing. Have you ever thought that that might be the case? That you know, everything else might lead up to that one thing? Well, this guy apparently had lived his life even into adulthood and was now a beggar because he was blind and that's what, beggar, that's what blind people did in their society. They just sat and begged. And that Jesus says he was born blind because it is going to bring glory to God. Wow. That's tough. I, I have to think about that. The mud is washed off. He comes back and the church people don't even want to recognize him. Are we sure this is the right guy? We think this is a different guy. He's the guy that used to beg over there. He's not the same guy. No. But then others said, oh yeah, he's the same guy. And he himself speaks up and says, I'm the same guy. What are you talking about? This is me. And then he gets hauled in in front of the, the elders. Tell the truth now. Your parents don't want to answer the question, so now we're going to ask you, who healed you? Oh, this guy over here. Oh, he couldn't have done that. We think he's a sinner. And then he basically chuckles, and, and, and they don't like it. You, you want to become one of his disciples? Oh no, we're disciples of Moses. Folks, as a, as a, as a church-going person, as a believer in a denomination, please do not make the same mistake that the church people in this text made, where it was more important to be part of the denomination than to believe in Jesus. And you think, how could that be? Pay attention. Because it's happening. It's happening. Where things in the traditions of the church become more important than Jesus. Stay awake. Stay alert. Because Jesus is saying, I'm the one who, well, he's not saying it now, but this man is saying, Jesus healed me and I don't think that God listens to sinners, so he must be somebody who is sent by God. Now to agree with him would have meant that they agreed with Jesus, and so they couldn't agree with Jesus, and they didn't want to agree with Jesus, and so what do they do? They threw him out. Threw him out of the church. Threw him out of the synagogue. Understand that there may be a price to pay if you follow Jesus. I hope in this congregation we don't have this problem. But let it be known that this, this pastor and this congregation are wanting to follow Jesus. And that everything that we do emanates from that desire and that decision. If we are not, I want to hear about it. If you are not and you feel uncomfortable, then I implore you to read these stories again. Listen to what happens. Hear the word of God as he is trying to shape you, trying to work with you, and trying to help you to, to say the traditions that have come down to you were meant for this. Jesus says, these are they that speak of me. Do you believe it? If you believe it, then it works. If not, 
then you are just like the church people that watched the blind man become a seeing man and did not want to believe that it was Jesus who had done this. Because that would have meant that they would have accepted him as their leader and as the Savior and as the Messiah. Same temptations, my friends, the same temptations happen today and they will happen this next week. You will be, you will be tempted not to believe in Jesus. You will be tempted to take the glory for yourself. God will send you signs and symbols. He will talk to you and then you will still be tempted to believe that this is not true, that this is not what you should be doing. That's the controversy that is going on in each one of our lives. And so God, in his mercy, uses many different ways in which to communicate with us, to talk with us, to help shape us. As this happens in your life, in my life this week, let us give him the glory. Let us give him the praise. Let us follow him. And he then will be our God and we will be his people. Amen. Amen.